Hello there, very warm welcome. You're tuned in to uh, Eye on Africa. I'm Rochelle ferguson Biahi. These are the top stories. The Speaker of Ivory Coast National Assembly, Guillaume Soro, steps down fueling speculation that the former Prime Minister and rebel leader could be vying for the presidency in 2020. What's in the fine print? We bring you details of an historic accord signed between the Central African Republic's government and 14 militia groups. Also coming up in the programme, Lend Me Your Ears, we look at the musicians in Nigeria trying to galvanise the youth vote ahead of a crucial general election scheduled for February 16th. We begin in Ivory Coast, where the uh, Speaker of the National Assembly, Guillaume Soro, stepped down this Friday, possibly signalling his intention to run for president in the polls next year. Well, relations between Soro and the current president, Alassane Ouattara, have been strained for the past few months. 2020 elections already look highly unpredictable. Watera hasn't confirmed whether he'll run again while his main coalition partner defected last year. Meanwhile, Watera's uh, bitter rival and ex-president Laurent Bagbo could also make a comeback. A standing ovation as Guillaume Soro resigns as speaker, a post he'd held since 2012. Dear colleagues, I would like to present to you now my resignation as Speaker of the National Assembly of Ivory Coast. I've decided to sacrifice my post for the peace of Ivory Coast. Soros' Friday resignation came as no surprise. Last week, President Alassane Ouattara had said the formal rebel leader would step down. A sign of the growing rift between the two former allies a rift some say is partly due to Soro's refusal to back the RHDP, the president's new ruling coalition, and partly due to Soro's potential plans to run for president in next year's election, plans Soro has not confirmed. A shift from the previous power-sharing relationship between the two, Soro served as Watara's first prime minister when the president came to power in 2011. In doing so, Soro broke with former President Laurent Bagbo, for whom he'd also served as prime minister under a power-sharing peace deal, signed in 2007 to bring an end to the country's five-year civil war. Soros' resignation marks yet more shifting alliances ahead of next year's election, an election some see as a toss-up, with neither Ouattara nor Soro confirming their candidacy and the potential return of Bagbo after his acquittal of crimes against humanity at the International Criminal Court last month. Next, details of an historic peace accord signed this week between the Central African Republic's government and 14 of its armed groups have been made public. After months of negotiations, the agreement was brokered by the African Union in the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. President Faustine Oshange Touadera has uh, called the accord a way of opening the door to peace in the war-torn nation. The deal, though, has been uh, shadowed by doubts about what it actually contains. Sally Shipborn has details. Here's the peace deal signed by the Central African government and 12 armed groups, the eighth such agreement in five years. First part of the text, a series of principles. All groups condemn the use of violence for political ends. The armed groups, which control some 80 percent of the country, have agreed to dissolve themselves and hand their weapons. Through the deal, their fighters will now be able to join mixed patrols with regular army forces. Meanwhile, their leaders could enter the new inclusive government, one of the deal's most contentious points. Some of these are responsible of violence committed against the population. Some are war criminals. Sharing power with these outlaws is something a big part of the Central African population will not accept. Other thorny issue, will criminals who killed, raped, assaulted and looted be tried or walk free? The word amnesty does not appear in the agreement. That was crucial. But the deal does stress that President Faustin Conche Touadera has the constitutional right to pardon people. And the text goes on to say this could encourage the reconciliation dynamic. Scores of mourners turned out in the Ghanaian capital this Friday to pay tribute to the investigative journalist Ahmed Hussein Suwali, who was shot dead after helping to expose corruption in African football. Hussein Suwali was uh, killed by two gunmen on a motorbike while driving near his home in Accra on January 16th. 
He'd worked on an undercover television documentary that depicted an outbanned FIFA official accepting cash in exchange for favourable deals. Well, police said on Thursday they'd arrested and bailed six people in connection with the murder. Is Ghana's Deputy Information Minister, Enam Hadzidi, speaking earlier. What happened was not only an attack on media freedom, but also a rollback of the progress made in terms of press freedom in this country. Government will continue to ensure citizens, including journalists, are given the needed security protection while they go about their duties. Amid a surge in reported cases of sexual assault, Sierra Leone's president has declared a national emergency over rape and sexual violence. More than 8,000 cases were recorded in 2018, almost 4,000 more than in 2017. In a keynote address on Thursday, President Julius Mada Bio warned that perpetrators are getting younger, as are the victims, with some 70% under the age of 15. Obio equally announced plans to create a special police force to tackle sexual violence against minors. Sexual assault on minors will now be punishable by life imprisonment. We take you next to Burkina Faso, where it's estimated some 9,000 children are sleeping rough. Some of them are orphans, others have been abandoned by their families or may simply have fallen in with the wrong crowd. Well, in a bid to reduce the number of young people without a roof over their heads, authorities have opened a shelter in the capital, Ouagadougou, to take them in. Our correspondents, Kalidusi and Bangale Touri, went to meet them. The Sangonde Children's Shelter in the suburbs of Ouagadougou is home to nearly 1,300 children. 80% of them are boys who are abandoned and left to fend for themselves. The children that live here are aged between 4 and 17 years old and have nowhere else to go. I was collecting cans. They saw me and told me to come here. I was sleeping at the Eastern train station and people came to talk to me. They said the minister had decided to take care of us and that we had to come to the center to change our lives. After I arrived, I wanted to leave, but they convinced us to stay. I want to become a soldier to defend my country. The shelter opened just six months ago. Staff are trying to rebuild their charges, trust and confidence. There are orphans, there are delinquents, but there are some that faced problems with their family and were tired of being at home. They're children that had lost hope. They're also the future of the country. More than half of these children were once beggars or street vendors. The Ministry of Family Affairs wants them to start exploring their options and is encouraging the kids to try out new skills. It helps to occupy the children. It also helps to detect the children's talents, to help guide them for their future careers. There is carpentry, metalwork or modern basket making. The children can stay at the shelter for a maximum of six months, so staff at the centre don't have much time to make an impact. But it's a start. Burkina Faso currently has around 9,000 street children. Authorities want to halve that number by 2020. And finally, with Nigeria's upcoming general election scheduled for February 16th, the campaign trail is heating up. But when it comes to those who are vying for the country's top job, it's not only experienced politicians who are in the race. In Nigeria, 18 to 35-year-olds account for more than half of the electorate. Musicians are hoping to tap into the youth vote. A well-known singer in Nigeria, Banky W may not know much about politics, but he does know how to engage with young audiences. At 37 years old, he's a fresh face compared to many Nigerian politicians. He is hoping his candidacy in the upcoming general election will help get young people interested in politics. The younger generation in Nigeria, we're not doing anything. We're talking, but we're not doing anything. And I feel like what we're trying to do is inspire our generation to care again, to pay attention again, to participate, to be involved, to play our role in changing the narrative, in fixing Nigeria. It's a popular message among many young Nigerians who are fed up with the seeming inability of the ruling classes to deal with the problems they face. He's seen as a candidate for change. I really kind of love him. He's a nice person. I love his music. And the way he's going for this, he's going to win. And I support him. He's a very simple guy. We all like him. 
So we want, we want him to rule us. As the election approaches, a politically engaged group of musicians has also emerged. They do not sing to sell records or fill clubs, but to fill polling stations with young people. The future of Nigeria is in the hands of the young people. And if we're not participating now, then it means we are probably, we are most likely not heading towards a, a, the best future. Of course, we'll have a future, but it won't be the best. In a country where 18 to 35 year olds make up 51% of the electorate, the youth vote is crucial. And yet, the most likely winners of the February 16th vote are both men in their 70s. Incumbent President Mohamedou Buhari is seeking a second term in office, with former Vice President Atiku Abubakar his main challenger. Despite their age, both of these candidates will do their best to inspire Nigeria's young people. Well, that's it for now. Your Iron Africa team will be back with uh, more news from the continent in about 45 minutes time. Up next, though, Nadia Massey is here with more uh, international headlines for you. Stay tuned. You're watching France 24. The Naha al-Bared camp in Lebanon contained over 30,000 Palestinian refugees. In May 2007, the Lebanese army attacked the camp to flush out terrorists, forcing women and children to flee. At the time, France 24 was the only media outlet to enter the camp and speak to the refugees. A decade later, only half its inhabitants have returned. France 24's Sofia Amara has been back to Little Palestine to meet the families who are rebuilding their lives from scratch. All this week, we revisit the Palestinian refugee camp Nahr al-Bared in Lebanon for France 24.